My father, I think, was rather quiet, but very thoughtful in his thinking. He'd been long thinking about it and the state the Ireland was in. And he was determined to do something about it for the good of the people, for the good of the country. Well, I was born in, during Larkin Strike, <laughs> 13th of September, 1913. My first memory begins, I suppose, in 1916. Always we had the uh, Rosie in Irish, and that's where I remember my first words that I learned, that I remember learning, the beginning of the Hail Mary in Irish. My father wanted to see me, so I, my mother brought me here. I was put on these steps with my sister before being brought up to my father. While I was on the steps here, my sister told me that one of the soldiers came over and said that he was sorry for me. When my father was in the prison cell, he spoke of the coldness in the air. I don't think it was the cold, but I think what at the back of his mind was he was leaving a family destitute for and one to come. In a time when the people were bitterly opposed to the trouble they considered was being brought on Ireland by this rising. He knew they would, they would suffer the consequences of that too. He knew the feeling of the people. He didn't blame them, neither did Connolly. I think these thoughts of that family left in, the, in Ireland at that time must have been the most agonizing thing to him. God and his blessed mother, again and again, bless and protect you, O Savior of man. If my dear ones could die and enter heaven with me, how blessed and happy I would be. They would be away from the cares and trials of the world. Una, my little one, be a nun. Joseph, my little man, be a priest if you can. James and John, to you the care of your mother. Make yourselves good, strong men for her sake. And remember, Ireland. My mother did not speak to me much about my father. She was very wise in her ways and did not want to take away from my childhood. How cool she was in an emergency when we were raided. I and my sister were in the room and the British soldiers were there. That she was thinking of us, but she was not a person without feeling, I know. Once, I did see her weeping silently, standing up. That might have been in the month of May, and I was young, and I told my younger sister, and we were very quiet. I once saw Michael Collins. 
marching down O'Connell Street. And O'Connell Street was in ruins. It was at the funeral of Arthur Griffith. My brother Seamus brought me down. I suppose he wanted me to remember that, the future. And that came back to my mind in Hong Kong when we had one million people marching over Tiananmen Square. Yeah, I went out to China, of course, in 1948. My health was good, and of course it was easier for me. I had no parents. I stepped from Ireland with those memories of the past, and I come into China and see what people have had to suffer in that in China. So I went up to Guangzhou, which is Canton, a desperately poor place up there. We lived in a house up there, wrote, learning Chinese, going down to school. Then, in May of the next year, 1949, the communists were coming down. They, um, some people were very nervous. The order was given anybody who is charge of other people, stay on. Those who are still in training, and I was as a student, say, trying to learn the language, they, could, they should leave. No use being stuck inside of China for them. So I was, as I say, led the retreat from China <laughs> in 1949. I was given charge of bringing down what we needed and setting up a house in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was packed tight with people, all flowing into it, people living with religion, staying with the, living on the streets, not a shanty town or that. Rather difficult to get our school going from practically nothing. Immediately, we were flooded with people coming in. It was rendered up with about 3,000 trying to get in. Being Irish was a very big thing at the beginning. Very big, it's still big. See, the colonial mind was very strong. Taking over a school, Chinese school, fully Chinese school, and running it, the Anglicans couldn't do that. We won't let an Englishman in. Well, you're welcome. I've climbed every mountain in Hong Kong, and it's full of mountains. I climbed every mountain a week or two. 800 steps in a day, that keeps you good. I've broken bones like anything all life, but that's my own fault, you know. No real sicknesses in my life, all right. In his last letter to my mother, my father said he wished that, if possible, I could become a priest. That, of course, was often mentioned to me by others later, but it didn't, I didn't think about it much. It just took it that I should go on, but my mother never mentioned it, all right. It was left completely free to myself. And I always felt that I should. That was what was the, not the thing I'd like to do, what I should do. I suppose at the bottom, in a way, it was a feeling that people had done so much at that time, not just the 1960, but all the others I'd met, that you couldn't just go and uh, make a, a life of your own for yourself. You have to do it somewhere. Some came from well-off and higher-class people. Others came from poverty. When we were growing up, you had to depend on your community more than you have nowadays. 
as the Chinese say, Tinha Wai Gung, which means we have, we have to share with others, and it's not just for ourselves alone. So many of the people in Ireland at that time had to put up with that sort of life, or they wouldn't have the life they have now if these people hadn't got that courage. And we were inspired to live up to these things because they had to take the price and there was death for them. Good, by my wife and darling. Remember me, God again bless and protect you and our children. I must now prepare. These last few hours must be spent with God alone. Your loving husband, Michael Mallon, Commandant Stephen Screen Command.